All right, going to take a few minutes here to answer this uh, Trinitarian heretic right here. Um, a refutation of Brian Denlinger's Godhead Doctrine. This was posted in one of the you know, videos I put out, and um, that this somehow refutes what I teach about the Godhead. Not even close. But uh, I'm playing this to prove what I've said over the years. Trinitarians hate Jesus Christ. They always have to tear him down. He's not Almighty God. God the Father's above him. That's what these people teach. And so they'll go through the scriptures and try to tear Jesus down, find anything anything that they can to attack Jesus Christ. All right? And then claim that they're orthodox for doing it. These people are servants of the devil. All right? Now I'm going to actually show you something really controversial after I play a little bit of this. I'm not going to go through the whole thing because he later on in the video he just starts reading scriptures and well, doesn't even explain what he's trying to prove from that. But some of the stuff the guy says in here is just incredible. So let's play this. A refutation to Brian Denlinger's Godhead Doctrine. Brian Denlinger, or the born-again barbarian, teaches that God the Father is the soul of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. It's the soul of God, God being Jesus Christ, yes. Christ is merely the fleshly body, and the Holy Spirit... Uh, uh, merely the fleshly body. See? Already we have... We are 20 seconds into the video, and he's already attacked Jesus. Merely the flesh. Incorruptible flesh, okay? Uh, that's who Jesus Christ is. He is the body of God. It's not a mere thing, but we'll continue. Spirit is the spirit, and this calculation equals the one monotheistic God. He concludes this based on 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, which describes the constitution of man as being body, soul, and spirit. I have no quarrel with the constitution of man. But to rob Jesus Christ of his individual personhood. <laughs> rob Jesus Christ of his individual personhood. That's a good one. I have to grant you that. That's a good one. Individual personhood. Chapter and verse, please. Uh, yeah. Uh, to rob Jesus Christ of his individual. Oh, you mean I'm taking something away from him that would actually mean he's lesser than God, the Father. Okay. Yeah, individual personhood. Um, I have no quarrel with the uh, body, soul, and spirit, and that's that's you know the constitution of, of what. Well, then what are you trying to say here? You're confused. Trinitarians are some of the most lying, deceitful devils out there. Uh, man is made after the similitude of God. Body, soul, spirit. It's not that hard. Let's continue. Is the most heretical mistake. For we read in Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21, that heresy is a work of the flesh that is not of the Holy Spirit. And those that commit uh, talk to yourself there. such a thing shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Thus Denlinger teaches that God the Father died upon the cross for the sins of the world. What? I have never taught that God the Father died upon the cross for the sins of the world. You are a liar. Again, one minute into the video, you've lied twice. That's a flat-out lie. Please post, uh, please, any video. Okay? There's no video at all where I've ever said that God the Father died on the cross. How can a soul die on the cross? Okay? Acts chapter 20, verse 28 talks about, you know, God purchasing the, the church with his own blood. I've talked about that and saying that Jesus Christ is tied into that, you know? But a father, the, the, couldn't have been the God the Father's blood. Souls don't have blood. And not the son who bears his own individuality. Yeah, you're a liar. I never said that. I never said that the son did not die on the cross. You're a liar. In this video, I will refute this attack on the triune Godhead, also known as the doctrine of the Trinity. Now, where's the doctrine of the Trinity at in Scripture? Triune Godhead. Uh, triune, where's that at in scripture? It's not there. So don't act all official, all the attack on the doctrine of the Trinity. There's no such thing in scripture. Okay, your, your God is an idiot who forgot to put his most important title, Trinity, or Triune, or whatever. He forgot to put it in the Bible, just kind of came out with it later through somebody else. You know, that's your idiot God. Now, Trinity is by no means used as a title for God, but rather it is to be used as a title 
for the specific doctrine that describes the attributes of God, particularly... A little sophistry there. It's not a title for God. Trinity is not a title for God, but for the, for the specific thing that we own. His composite unity. First John... Composite unity, chapter and verse. That's right. Philosophical terms added to make it work, yeah. Chapter 5, verse 7 states, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. In order for each record to be true, there must be taken into consideration each individual record that are in perfect alignment and agreement. This is to say that the witness of all three united individuals that by no means are separated are harmonious and without deviation. Did Jesus have his own soul and spirit? Considering that the constitution of being fully man requires him to have body, soul, and spirit, we must conclude that... Uh, really? He has to be fully man, so it requires him to have his own body, soul, and spirit. Chapter and verse, please. Weird. So weird. That Jesus had his own soul and spirit. To deprive him of such is to totally remove his person and his ability to have an intimate relationship with the Father while being in the form of... Intimate relationship with the Father? Oh, you little papist, you. Uh-huh. Yeah, I refuted that whole thing, too. It's nonsense. God, and in the form of man. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 6-11, through 11, we read, Who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus... A name which is above every name, including uh, the Father's name? In him, he, that in Jesus, he might have the preeminence? King of kings and Lord of lords, the blessed and only potentate? That would put him above the Father, wouldn't it? If they're two separate persons, have a problem there. Every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Isaiah 53, verses 10 through 12 states as follows. Yet it pleased the Lord, Jehovah, to bruise him, he hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. This messianic prophecy describes the suffering soul of the Messiah as being a pleasure to God the Father. Uh, 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 now you're adding to the scriptures. Where does it say God the Father in there? Come on. Come on. You're adding to the scriptures. What you don't understand is that the body, soul, and spirit are separate within God. They can separate. They can speak to one another. See? And later on, he'll talk about this, that the, the body cannot do anything without the soul. We know that the body can't speak without the soul. So, therefore, that proves that, you know, uh, you're talking about man there. See, you're very ignorant of who God is and the fact that they can speak to each other. I mean, I already answered this in one of my videos, but of course he doesn't look that up. Further, furthermore, it foretells of Christ who shall be the one mediator between God and man, for Jesus is our high priest. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3-6 through six reads, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved, and to come into the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. And in the okay, um, how can God the Father be a mediator if he's the soul? Did he know what it's like to suffer on the cross? Did he know what it's like to be tempted to sin? No, that would be the body. You have no point there. 
Okay, Jesus Christ took on a body of flesh. A body hast thou prepared me, the Bible talks about. He takes on a body of flesh prepared by the Godhead, comes to earth, and there he is. He suffers. He knows what we go through and everything else. That's why he's the mediator. Not that hard to figure that out unless you're a Trinitarian. In the New Testament scripture concerning the final hour of the crucifixion, we read in Luke 23, 46, and when Jesus had... This is, this is another one of the little tricks these people come out with. You know, he has his own spirit. Watch this. cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. We note that Jesus committed his own spirit and not the Holy Spirit, which Brian Denlinger erroneously teaches. <laughs> okay, so Jesus had his own spirit that's not the Holy Spirit. Really? Okay, so Jesus being God, um, let me... Just show you something there, funny bunny. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, where are we at here? Okay, one spirit right there. Drinking two, one spirit. Okay. Um, there's only one spirit in God. If man is made after the similitude of God, and God is a body, soul, spirit, man being body, soul, spirit as well, how could there be more than one spirit in God? See, it, Trinitarians don't even think about this stuff. You attack what I believe, but then what's the reverse of that? What you believe? Let's look at what you believe. So in other words, Jesus had a spirit within him that was not the Holy Spirit. Can we all say heresy together? Okay, so his Jesus had a spirit, and you have the Holy Spirit. That's another spirit. So, a little satanic there. It to have been. Did Jesus not quote Psalm thirty-one five, which reads, "Into thine hand I commit my spirit. Thou hast redeemed me, O Lord God of truth." According to Brian, this messianic psalm would be the body Christ speaking to the Father soul. However, no such mm -hmm. body speaks without the soul. <laughs> no such body speaks without the soul. That's what I told you about earlier. No such body speaks without a body can't speak without a soul. Chapter and verse, please. And um, why would you try to make God the same as man? You say, well, man can't speak, bodies can't speak without a soul. To, okay. Um, then uh, is the same true for God? See, it's just weird. Weird. For the soul is what animates the human body, and without the soul... The what body? The human body? Oh, chapter and verse on the word human, but the, but I thought you're comparing this to God. But now you're talking about a human body. Are we talking about God or man here? The body is dead, bearing no individuality of its own. To give up the ghost is to physically die, and so we read in Ecclesiastes 12, 6-7, Wherever the silver cord be loosed, then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit shall return unto God who gave it. Furthermore, Jesus states in Matthew 15, 18 through 20, But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. Do such defilements not proceed from the inmost soul? For God states that the soul that sinneth shall die, in Ezekiel 18.20. Denley? Uh, yeah, now we're jumping back to the Old Testament, where the soul and the body are connected. There's no circumcision made without hands. What a stinking heretic. What a nut. Here teaches that the father's soul was within the body he calls Jesus, while also being simultaneously enthroned in heaven. His proof text is mm -hmm. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6, which reads, And hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Thus, Denlinger teaches that the Christian soul is currently seated in heaven, while also being within the body, which is to be in two places at once. Yeah, it's eternal. Okay, um, and you say, well, uh, you can't prove that. Okay, here's a good one for you. Give you a good verse. Uh, okay, I'll do it this way. I don't remember the exact. 
um, there. And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. Ha. Huh. So Jesus is on the earth there uh, and in heaven at the same time. How does that work? If anybody doesn't understand that. However, Denlinger has taken this excised passage out of context. For we read excised passage out of context. Read prior in verses one through five. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in times past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of the flesh, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. <clears throat> This is to say that we should walk in the Holy Spirit, having our reservations in heavenly places for the eternal glorification that is to come. Did Jesus not say in Luke chapter 10, verse 19 through 22, Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions? Just well, hold on a second there. So you're just skipping away from it. It's just sort of we should do it. So in the future, we no, it's it's present tense. Okay, it's present tense. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We have fellowship with the Lord. I'm part of the body of Christ right now, not some point in time in the future. Okay? Major problems here. And over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding in this rejoice not, that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. In that hour Jesus rejoiced in spirit and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. All things are delivered to me of my Father, and no man knoweth who the Son is but the Father, and who the Father is but the Son and he to whom the Son will reveal him. And he hasn't revealed him to you, fair partner. You don't know the Father, and you don't know the Son. You're an Antichrist. Our souls are within our bodies at this present hour, and we are not physically seated in heaven as souls. But rather, Ephesians 2.6 speaks of the unity with Christ, for we are also told... And, okay, uh, dummy, where's Christ at? It speaks of unity with Christ. Okay, where's he at? He's in heaven where our souls are seated together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That we the church exist as the body of Christ upon earth. Therefore the text is about spiritual unity. Jesus is not physically upon the earth no more than our souls souls are physically within the courtrooms of heaven and this is proven in revelation chapter 3 verse 21 when jesus promises the believer to him that overcometh will i grant to sit with me in my throne even as i also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne that's talking about rewards it's not talking about what your happens with your soul what a stinking heretic this is this is the kind of satanism right here this devils that are helping this guy to just twist the scriptures. He's resting the scriptures unto his own destruction. We are in unity with Christ, and therefore Jesus prayed directly to the Father in John 17 verses 20 through 21. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. In John 3:16 verse or in John 3 verses 16 through 18 we read For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved He that believeth on him is not condemned but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. 
According to Brian Denlinger, the body which he calls Jesus is also labeled as the Son of God, which I find to be a rather bizarre interpretation. Oh, what? Huh? Uh, the body of God is also the Son of God? Yeah. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. Okay, it's bizarre interpretation. Huh? For why would the Father's soul call his own body his son? And how was the offer? Because that's the way they worked it out. What's Jesus going to do? Come down to the earth, be born of the Virgin Mary, and say, um, uh, yeah, I don't really know who my father is. I'll, I'll just say I don't have a father or whatever. Offering up of Isaac by Abraham, a figure of Christ, when both Abraham and Isaac had their own individual wills being two persons. Yeah, it's a type. It's not the same thing. It seems Brian neglects the warning of Psalm chapter 2, which reads... <laughs> Why do the heathen rage, and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Uh, uh, huh? What? 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 Can we read plain English? Um, they that sit in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord and his boy shall have them in derision. Anybody home? Hello? Hello? Knock, knock. Anybody there? He is singular. The Lord. Singular. Is there any God beside me? I know not any. Beside me there is no Savior. The Lord our God is one. Listen to a little bit more here. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath, and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance in the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Is this wrath, not the wrath of the Lamb, as described in Revelation chapter 6, verse 15 through 17? And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? And John 14 verses 6 through 31 we read Jesus said unto him I am the way the truth and the life no man cometh unto the father but by me if ye had known me ye should have known my father also and from henceforth ye know him and have seen him Philip saith unto him Lord show us the father and it sufficeth us Jesus said unto him have I been so long time with you and yet hast thou not known me Philip he that hath seen me hath seen the father and how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I, that I speak... Hold on there. Hold on. Let's focus on the scripture here, partner. Let's not just zip by the verses. You see, they all do this. They can't handle it. Because they hate Jesus. All Trinitarians hate Jesus Christ. They have a problem with the flesh of God. Why? Because they have a problem with their own flesh. Yeah, you'll see that. I'll just let's just a little read past that, and we'll just try to cover up some things here quickly. I'll play a little bit more here, but you have to hear the other video. It's really good. Unto you I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me. He doeth the works. Believe that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. You see, if Brian's theology is correct, then 
Jesus would be saying, Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, that he would be the body speaking. Um, or we can go back up to the actual verses there, where it says, He that hath seen me, uh, He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. Show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? Let's just skip this verse here and try to talk about what's going on down in here, which still proves that Jesus is the Father, by the way, that they're one and the same being. When I say Jesus is the Father, you Trinitarians, you have rocks for brains. You know, you think, oh, then there's no Son. Brian denies the Son of God. You're an imbecile, okay? Jesus is the Son of God. The body is the Son of God. The soul is God the Father. Why? Because that's how God worked out in his word. It's not what I teach. It's not my my particular peculiar, but it's what the Bible teaches. And the Spirit of God is the Holy Ghost. Man is made after the similitude of God. Three in one. Simple. It's not hard. And you say, well, Brian, why are you being so sarcastic? Because you have somebody that hates Jesus Christ and comes out and they're rebuking me for teaching what the Bible teaches. Rebuke them sharply. That's what I'm doing. And he would say, the words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, which would be the body speaking, which is absurd. Because if Jesus is the body, the body does not speak on its own without the soul, so therefore it must... The, the body does not speak on its own without the soul. <laughs> huh? Where in the world does he get that? I mean, some philosophical Trinitarian nonsense. I understand where he gets it from, but you know, where are you getting this stuff in the scriptures? It's not there. It be the Father speaking as the soul. But yet there's clarification here of two entities that are united. Two entities that are united. Uh, really? Do uh, you get that from the verse? No. And see, again, this guy is totally ignorant of the fact that God, when he is there as one being, one person, Multiple voices can speak out of him. In other words, the soul can speak, the spirit can speak, and the body can speak. That's the amazing thing about God. He doesn't understand that. All right, let me show you the scripture on that, which will lead us into the other video. I'm not going to waste any more time on this idiot in terms of this verse, but uh, Hosea chapter 12. And he doesn't even understand this, but Hosea 12 verse 4 um, says, There he spake with us. Jacob speak or wrestling with the angel, and he says, There he spake with us. Okay? Us. Plural. And what he'll do in this next video, he'll read this, and he doesn't talk about this. You aren't going to believe his interpretation of Genesis chapter 32. It's incredible. But then he skips this verse. The us there, he skips verse 5. He will not read it. Even the Lord God of hosts, the Lord is his memorial. Jacob sets up a memorial to the Lord. And you know who this, this devil right here, this whoever this guy is, alms for the poor, uh, you know who he is, or what he says? He says it's actually Lucifer. Here's a video. Who did Jacob wrestle with? Same channel. All right? So let's go over this one now. This one's real good. I'll play the whole video here because you have to hear this one. He actually says that Jacob is wrestling with the devil. Okay, let's go to the passage here real quickly. So we can make sure to follow along with this Satanist. So this is chapter 32. We'll go down here to the end. And, um, and they're wrestling. Right here starts in verse 24. goes down through. And um, thy name shall be no more called, or shall call, be called no more Jacob but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men. Okay, and has prevailed. It's God wrestling with him. Okay, and he says, Jacob called the, the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. And this guy, this devil here actually says that Jacob, no, I, no, he's, that's not true. Jacob, either Jacob was deceived or he flat out lied because this little jerk right here said so. You'll hear him say it. It's unreal. That's why I warn people about Trinitarians. Trinitarians are satanic. 
when they really truly get into the deep things of, of Trinitarianism, it's a it's a false set of gods, and they are they're evil people. I'm telling you what, there's people that just say Trinitarian terms and they don't really believe it because they're ignorant of the subject, but you get a really hardcore Trinitarian, they are satanic. Servants of the devil. Okay? But check this out. Let's play this. This is Lucifer here. Who did Jacob wrestle with in the book of Genesis? Many have proposed that Jacob wrestled with Jesus Christ in the book of Genesis. But I find that to be very unlikely. So <laughs> I find that to be very unlikely. Yeah, <laughs> okay. So in this video we're going to discuss who Jacob wrestled with and why. When Jacob wrestled with the angel, for in the book of Hosea chapter 12 verse 4, there is the mentioning that Jacob wrestled with the angel. He prevailed over the angel. Okay, so he knows about Hosea chapter 12 verse 4. Uh, let me get it here. This guy's, oh man, crazy. Hosea 12, 4. Yea, he had power over the angel and prevailed. He wept and made supplication unto him. He found him in Bethel, and there he spake with us. He doesn't cover this right here. Okay. But uh, the angel there is the angel of the Lord. If you do the tie-ins to the New Testament, you'll see, you know, Paul is saying about the angel of the Lord, uh, the, or the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve. There's a bunch of scriptures to talk about it. He had power over the angel. Was this angel not Satan, who surely wanted to prove his strength over God's creation before God and all of the heavenly hosts? Nevertheless, he was outwitted by the Lord, for the Lord fought alongside Jacob. The Spirit of God was upon Jacob. Uh, where does it say the Lord fought alongside Jacob? While he was wrestling with Lucifer. Where does it say that? You mean you'd create your own scripture? Yeah. So we're going to read in the book of Genesis about this wrestling match. Let's do and that. And he, Jacob, rose up that night and took his two wives and his two woman servants and his eleven sons and passed over the four Jabbok. And he took them and sent them over the brook and sent over that he had. And Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man with him, until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint, as he wrestled with him. And he said, Let me go, for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. And he said unto him, What is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, Okay, um, now listen to, to, to this. Jacob, according to Dimwit here, Jacob is wrestling with Lucifer, with Satan, and he says to Lucifer, I'm not letting you go until you bless me. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay, yeah, you want the blessing of Lucifer on your life. I mean, buddy, you have rocks for brains here. Do you understand that? Play it. Said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. And Jacob asked him. Okay. Um, now notice that. He asked for a blessing. Okay. Right here. Except thou bless me. Jacob asked him his name. And he says, or excuse me. Um, the angel says to him, what is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he says, thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. So Satan gives him a blessing. And later on, God actually starts to call Jacob Israel. So Satan does the blessing, and according to Nutty Boy, Satan does the blessing, and then God has to submit to that blessing and start calling him by the name that Satan came up with. <laughs> oh, come on, man. Trinitarians, see what I'm talking about? Good night. And said, tell me, I pray thee thy name. And he said, Wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? And he blessed him there. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel. For I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. 
And as he passed over Penuel, the sun rose upon him, and he halted upon his thigh. Therefore the children of Israel eat not of the sinew which shrank, which is upon the hollow of the thigh, unto this day, because he touched the hollow of Jacob's thigh, and the sinew that shrank. So Jacob said, I have seen God face to face. But I find that unlikely. Just because he called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face. Uh, I find that unlikely. Okay. You know, you made it 2021, but, you know, Jacob that was there thousands of years ago. Yeah, I find that unlikely. I've seen God face to face. No, I don't agree. <laughs> okay. And he sets up a memor memorial there. Um, and what's it say here? Let me get up to there. What's going on with my mouse here? Not working. Probably dirty or something. Okay, Hosea 12. Let's take that thing off there. 12 verse. I think it's my mouse pad. Um, okay. Even the Lord God of hosts, the Lord is his memorial. Okay, what's the memorial? Um, Genesis chapter 32. He sets up a memorial. The Lord is his memorial, not the devil. Okay. And Jacob called the place Peniel. For I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. Okay. I find it unlikely that he wrestled with God. For if he had wrestled with God, he would not have prevailed. The angel told Jacob that... But that's what the text said. He had power with God. This does not mean that the angel was God, but rather that Jacob had power over the angel with the help of God's spirit. Therefore, the angel was saying that the only reason you have prevailed against me is because you have power with God. Oh, well, that's what the angel said, huh? That's not what the Bible says, though. In the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, verse 10 through 13, we find a parallel passage. It says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against princi principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. So there is the mentioning of wrestling with the forces of darkness, which is a parallel passage because Jacob wrestled with a force of darkness. <laughs> hey, idiot. Um, did the angel that he wrestled with, did it have flesh and blood? Or is he just wrestling with a spirit? You know, I don't know where he went. Where did he go? Yeah. He was wrestling with a being that had a physical body. But see, as a Trinitarian, you can't believe that because of the you know, pre-incarnate Jesus and, you know, Christophany or whatever they call it, theophany. Uh, yeah, you can't believe in that stuff, yeah. It's a parallel passage. Oh, man. But he prevailed because of God's spirit. <sighs> Thus, Satan could not overcome Jacob because of God's intervention. And so we find Christ. Re remember, this is Jesus, the angel of the Lord that wrestled with Jacob. And this devil is calling it, he's saying it's, it's Satan. He's calling Jesus Satan. Have I proved my point yet, folks? Trinitarians hate Jesus. And they prove it because the spirit that's in them, as they start to try to explain away things in the Bible that, you know, go against the Trinity... All of a sudden, the spirit that leads them starts to make them hate Jesus and starts to make them attack Jesus Christ. They might not consciously be even aware of what they're doing, but the devil spirits that are in them start to make them go against Jesus Christ. I've seen it. Christ, with King of Kings and Lord of Lords, written upon his vesture and upon his thigh in Revelation chapter 19, verse 16, that it might reveal that he, too, has wrestled with Satan the God of this world, and overcome him. And Jesus says in John 16, 33, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. 
Howbeit that Lucifer desperately wanted Jacob to release him before the sun arose. So, so what was the John 16? Is that trying to prove a, I've overcome the world? Did Jesus wrestle the world then, apparently? Kind of let that one go. Rose, lest all the world in heaven and earth would behold his defeat. Hosea 12.4 reads, Yea, he had power over the angel, and prevailed. He wept and made supplication unto him. He found him in Bethel, and there he spake with us. Lucifer is called son of the morning in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. Uh, or, uh, 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 what about uh, he spake with us? What about verse 5? He spake with us. Even the Lord God of hosts, the Lord is his memorial. How'd you miss that one? Deceiver. He's a liar. Or star of the morning. <sighs> Young's literal translation calls him son of the dawn. The star uh, that. Uh, uh, uh. There you go. Young's literal translation. I'll quote the new versions there. Yeah. Shines into the morning, outshining all other stars, is the star of pride. The author proposes that this wrestling match was an arrangement. So, okay, let's get back and hear that again. I want to discover that again. He's calling the bright morning star Lucifer again. Okay, Lucifer is not the bright morning star. The bright morning star is Jesus Christ. 14 verse 12, or star of the morning. Young's literally, okay. he had power over the angel and prevailed. He wept and made supplication unto him. He found him in Bethel, and there he spake with us. Lucifer is called son of the morning in Isaiah chapter 14 verse 12, or star of the morning. Young uh, star of the morning in Isaiah 14 12, uh oh. The Hebrew word kokab there, uh, star, is nowhere in the text. So you put anything about a star in Isaiah 14, 12, you're lying. And he has to quote a new version. Young's literal translation calls him son of the dawn. The star that shines into the morning, outshining all other stars, is the star of pride. The author... Hmm, the star of pride, that's Jesus proposes that this wrestling match was an arrangement in which Satan challenged God over Jacob's physical, if not spiritual, strength. It was as the scenario of Job in which Satan predicts Job will turn against God if God allows him to destroy his family. But where is there anything at all about the devil coming and challenging God and saying, let me wrestle Jacob. I want to go down and wrestle him. And I'll show you how strong I am. Huh? Prosperity and health. Job chapter 2 verse 3 says, And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God, and escheweth evil? And still he holdeth fast his integrity. Although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. So, in conclusion to this video, it seems to me that that will... That is precisely what was going on when this angel provoked Jacob to this wrestling match. And it was a direct challenge against God by this unnamed angel. Which I believe, or whom I believe, was Satan. So there you have it. Or who? This devil right here says that the Lord God of hosts is Satan. That's his God. That's his Lord. Um, this is why I'm so rough on Trinitarians. They will scour the scriptures. They will go over verse after verse trying to find anything that they can to tear Jesus Christ down. He's not almighty God. In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Uh, no. He has his own body, soul, and spirit. He's lesser than the Father. Don't you dare say he's the Father. That's what Trinitarians do. They're servants of the devil, every single one of them. And if you're holding on to this Trinity stuff, and you will not let go of it, you're on your way to hell. I can tell you that. Okay, the scriptures are very clear about the fact that Jesus Christ is God. Almighty God. And if you reject that, then you're rejecting what the Bible plainly teaches. Be very careful about Trinitarian liars that will come to you and they'll do those little videos. Watch my video. I've refuted Brian Denlinger. No, you didn't.
Okay? Please stand by the King James Bible and uh, study the issue. Thank you for watching.